Well, good morning. Um, we're going to continue in our study through uh, Matthew's gospel account. And uh, today we are looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And the sermon this week is on giving. And I really think the text is good for us today. In the midst of all the things that are going on, all the things we're dealing with, it is a good reminder for us, especially the heart behind it and what Jesus addresses here and what he desires. But also, I want to remind us that this is a gift. Whether we are together or separated, it is a gift to look at the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And we ought to approach that. We ought to do that with joy. And I hope that is the way all of us are coming together, looking at the word today. I'm going to read the text, Matthew chapter 6. You can follow along verses 1 through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Grace that you display in so many ways, ways that we are absolutely undeserving of. We're not deserving of your word. We're not deserving of your forgiveness. We're not deserving of your son. We're not deserving of the love that you continue to pour out on us. Lord, we're just not deserving. But you're so gracious. And we pray for your help as we look at the text today, that you be glorified in our time together. We pray that you would help us to search our hearts, help us to uh, respond to what you say in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. I want to focus on this for a bit, this verse. It's good for every single one of us who follow Jesus and who seek to obey his commands. Whether you're a person who gives faithfully to the church and to those in need or not, we need this. We need this direction from the Lord. We need to meditate on what he's saying here. We need Jesus' input here, his encouragement and his warning. Beware, he says. And I want to say from the beginning, some of you are faithful givers. You strive to display God's love and respond to his grace by giving, and you give faithfully. You're a blessing to many and a testimony of God's saving grace. You display him even in how you give. The beginning of the text is Jesus speaking here. Not just of the act of giving, but of the heart of all who claim to follow him. All who claim to know him. All who claim to love him. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them. Now, righteousness is right standing before God based on the work of Christ. We are made righteous. In fact, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that's Jesus, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So righteousness is our standing, right standing before God based solely on the work of Christ. That righteousness is granted to us. It is credited to our account. Jesus comes to earth and lives a perfect life, something that We must confess we cannot do. We don't come close to it. We can't live a perfect hour. But Christ comes and lives a perfect life, sinless, 
and lays his life down on the cross. And on the cross, God treats him not as a sinless sacrifice, but a sinful sacrifice, as if Jesus lived the way that we live. And then when we come to Christ in faith, God then, by his grace, unimaginably treats us as if we lived the way that Christ lived his life. Perfect. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 means. God made Jesus to be sin, even though he knew no sin, so that in Jesus, we can be treated as if we lived the way he did. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So righteousness is our standing before God based on the work of Christ. Righteous deeds or righteous acts are things done in response to and worship of Christ who makes us and our deeds righteous. Practicing your righteousness refers to righteous deeds, the things we do. Now notice Jesus doesn't say here that practicing righteousness should never be done in front of people or others. He says, beware that we don't do it before others to be seen by them. He's talking about our motives here. He's talking about our heart, what our motives or what are our motives in doing righteous deeds. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Why do we do good? Why do we give? If our motive is wrong, the act has no heavenly value is what Jesus is saying and will receive no heavenly reward. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them for if that's the way you're doing your righteousness, if that's why you're doing your righteous deeds, you will have no reward from your father who's in heaven. That's the point Jesus is making in this text and in the following ones. This is a section dealing with hypocrisy. It goes on. Verse 2, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Giving to the needy or the poor isn't the only example Jesus is going to give for hypocrisy, but it is a perfect one. At the time of Jesus, almsgiving or giving to the poor was an important part of temple worship or synagogue worship. One commentator writes, synagogues functioned as social agencies in the first century, providing relief for the poor who depended on contributions from people. And Jesus is saying, when you give, when you do your alms giving, when you give to the needy, don't announce your giving with loud trumpets the way the hypocrites do. Now that's, that's, that's a picture, right? He's, he's showing what the heart desired. It's, it's this picture he's presenting of imagine going into the synagogue with your gift that you're giving to the needy and sounding trumpets, loud horns, so that people will see and notice when you give. Imagine that on a Sunday morning as we gather together and the offering plate comes by, imagine someone being in the congregation and blowing trumpets just before they put their gift into the offering. Or imagine, more specifically to the text, going into the streets, seeing someone who is needy, homeless, and pulling out a trumpet and blasting the trumpet so that everyone around could see and you give this person the gift that you intend to give. That's nonsense. And yet, Jesus is making a point here, that's exactly what the heart of the hypocrite desires and does. That's what they do. A hypocrite in the early use of the word was an actor who wore a mask in a Greek play, pretending he was something he was not. And so that meaning of hypocrite comes from that. It's a word that that, uh, is used of someone who looks one way, but is 
completely different on the outside. You, you see something on the, or on the inside. You see something on the outside and you think this is what this person is like, but on the inside, it's something completely different. And when you think of hypocrites or hypocrisy, usually those who are hypocrites practice a conscious deception. In other words, they know what they're doing. They, they want to be seen a certain way. But as D.A. Carson notes, in this case, the person is likely deceiving himself as well as others. And if that is true, we ought to take notice of what Jesus is saying here. We should heed Jesus' words, and we should beware. They give, Jesus is saying, but their reason and their desire is that others would notice them, that others would see them, that others would respond to them. Truly, I say to you, Jesus says, they have received their reward. Now think about the weight of that statement. This is Jesus making a solemn declaration. Such praise, whatever praise this person gets, is all the reward they're ever going to get. And I want to say here, in a culture that is consumed with social media and a drive in our hearts to to get people to follow us or to get people to like what we have posted or to share even better to share so that more people can see what we've posted or to retweet it or on and on and on in a culture that is consumed with that, that may sound like enough. And I fear that for many people in our culture, that would be enough that the praise of man is sufficient for them. Think about that for a moment. Think about how low our desires have fallen if that's enough for us. Right now, Jesus says, they are receiving all of the reward they will ever get. If the motive is that I am seen by other people, that I am applauded by other people, that I get pats on the back, that I'm affirmed, that I'm adored, that I'm loved, whatever it is. If that's the heart of giving, Jesus says, that's all the reward you're going to get. Another commentator writes this, they receive their pay then and there, and they receive it in full. God owes them nothing. They were not giving, but buying They wanted the praise of men. They paid for it, and they have got it. The transaction is ended, and they can claim nothing more. We never, ever want our hearts to go to a place where we are satisfied with the praise of men rather than the desire to praise our Lord with what we do. Jesus continues in verses 3 and 4, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now that, that expression that Jesus gives there of don't let your left hand see or know what your right hand is doing, that's, that's, a, um, that's an example, it's an idiom of, uh, for total privacy that it would be in secret. That's what he's saying there. Disregarding yourself entirely, even in your giving. Deny yourself in the act of helping the poor. In other words, just as Jesus' call for discipleship is, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The, The call of discipleship must infect the heart of giving. We're called to deny ourselves, even in our giving. Don't let your left hand see what your right hand is doing. 
giving should be done with no desire for praise or notice from others. And Jesus reminds us in these verses that God sees our heart. God isn't just looking at or for our actions. He's looking at our motives. Why am I doing that? Am I doing it as a hypocrite? Or am I doing it as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, a lover of God? Hebrews 4.13 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, the psalmist says, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light for you. There is nowhere we can go and nothing we can do where God doesn't see the heart of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then he says this, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Your father will reward you, whether that's referring to present reward from God or future eternal reward or both It is far better than any gain you can get from people noticing what you're doing. And if we can just pause for a moment and think that Jesus says that God will reward us, God the Father will reward us for what we do for Christ. Think about the reality of that for a moment. God graces us with salvation. I didn't do anything to get saved. God graces us with gifts. Everything we have, every penny that we have, every job that we have, everything we have is because of His grace. God graces us with faith. God graces us with his commands. God graces us with himself. God graces us again and again and again and again and again. And then says, if you respond to all that I've given to you, I will reward you. It's almost like me giving a gift to one of my sons for Christmas morning. And he opens it up. And he's excited and he loves it. And he goes upstairs and he begins using what I gave to him as a gift. It would be as if I went upstairs and pulled him aside and said, I can't believe you're using that. I can't believe you're doing with that what it was intended to do. I'm going to give you a whole lot more because you're using the gift that I gave to you. That is exactly what Jesus is saying here. It's all by grace. And yet he says, on top of all of my grace that enables you even to be someone who would give, I'm going to reward you for doing it. It's unbelievable. And how we could ever strive for the praise of man over that is unthinkable. It's unthinkable. We give not as a means of getting attention from others. That's that's no gain at all. We give because we love God. We give because we want to respond to all that he has given us. Three things I want to give to us very briefly 
that giving from the heart displays. First is this, giving displays to others and to ourselves what God is like. 2 Corinthians 8 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. In our richness, our spiritual richness, we should care for the materially and spiritually poor. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave to us. And so when we give, that displays the character and heart of God to others. Secondly, giving displays a heart of worship. We give because we want to bring praise to the one who has given so much to us. Paul describes God as one who lavishes his grace on us in Ephesians chapter 1. And we can bring praise and honor and worship to him by reflecting that because we are saying when we give rightly, I trust you. You are worthy of this. And third, giving is a display of God-inspired joy. You think about Jesus and what he went through and what the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We ought to give with joy as Jesus did in response to him. Knowing the joy set before us that even our present suffering and sacrifice doesn't compare to the joy that is coming. Knowing the joy set before us when we give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful or joyful giver. And in all of this, in closing, I want to remind you, some of you are giving faithfully. You display the character of God. You worship Him with what you have, including your time. You display God-inspired joy. Some of you um, give a little, maybe not at all, and Jesus' words may feel like a burden to you. Some of you may give, but maybe more like the hypocrite that He talks about. You give when it benefits you by getting attention or praise from others. And wherever you fall in that, I want to encourage you and implore you, we are called to, to strive to excel in this act of giving, in this grace of giving. That's the way Paul refers to it in 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. And Jesus certainly speaks in a way that assumes in chapter 6 of Matthew that we are giving in some way or in some ways. He doesn't, he doesn't say if you give. He says when you give. It's our motives that he's addressing. And so let's strive to that end, to grow, to excel in this grace. It is grace. It's a grace to display his character. It's a grace to worship him. It is a grace to display the love and joy we have because of him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. We love you and we're amazed by your grace. Grace that would say to us, here is salvation. Here is this gift and I will reward you for using it. It's unimaginable grace, Lord. You are so good to us and we pray for your help. Pray that we would not be those who give as hypocrites, but who give as disciples, worshipers of you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm grateful. And until we are able to gather again, until we feel like it's wise and safe to do that, I want to encourage you, if you have questions or interest in Cornerstone, go to our website, ohiocornerstone.com. You'll find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ohiocornerstone. And if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to email us and let us know. We would love to hear from you. Uh, but thanks so much and God bless.